Welcome back to the Weekly Juice Podcast. My name is Ryan Bevilacqua. I'm joined alongside my co-host, as always, Corey Jacobson. This is episode 12. Today, we're going to talk personal finance and legacy real estate investing. Um, we're very excited. We have a special guest, Rio, coming on. I'll let Corey introduce him in a little bit, but he's going to talk about his units, how he got started, and his vision for financial success. Yeah, cool. So our last couple episodes have been about real estate, financial independence specifically, Ian off of last week. And uh, we have another really awesome guest, Rio Tomlin. And Rio actually is dating my cousin. The funny, funny, really funny story how they met. Uh, I And Rio maybe dives into that, but uh, actually it was like out of, my family was out of the country and they connected each other. But then Rio and I kind of got to talking about real estate and he's been in real estate with his father for, years you know since you know, i think his dad had it before he was even born so he'll tell you more about that he's got an awesome story about investing in two specific areas he invests in new york and he invests in austin um and i just think he's got really good perspective being someone who's in his uh late 20s early 30s and just he gets it he understands financial independence and he i think he's got a lot a really great message to share so without further ado um rio tomlin how you doing Good. How you guys doing? <laughs> We're great, man. Great. Thanks for coming on. I, I think first we just want to hear a little bit of background about you, uh, how, you know, what your financial independence philosophy is and like, how, you know, how your real estate portfolio kind of ties into that. Um, yeah. So uh, where do I start? My father started investing in real estate kind of indirectly. He backed into it. Uh, I think this is the way a lot of people do it now too, where he started as just a contractor. He was a carpenter in New York in the 60s and the 70s. So he was renovating buildings and then he realized he just can do so much work and he can add value to these spaces. So he was finding these deals and then talking to his other contractor friends. He talked to an electrician, talked to a painter and said, look, if the three of us each pool this little bit of money, we can control this property. And then he started flipping that way. And then they started doing bigger spaces, doing buildings. And then before he knew it, he was taking control of a five story building in New York. He would keep one floor. The other contractor would keep the second floor, third floor would be the third contractor. And then they'd sell the top two. So that's how he got started uh, little by little. And then he built up to the point where through the seventies and the eighties, then he had a lot of real estate in New York city um, in Soho, which at the time was just empty abandoned warehouses. <laughs> he was one of the, Yeah. He was controlling whole warehouses on 99 year leases. Um, 99 year that, leases? Wait, so hold on a second. We're talking about Soho yeah. real estate in New York City, buying it in the 60s, yeah. 70s, like you said. Maybe mm -hmm. this was something like you said that he fell into, but he probably, I mean. Oh, he had a vision. I mean, okay, great. That's great. The vision is yeah. awesome. But like, think about Soho now. You can't buy a property in Soho for mm -hmm. less than $5 million, right? I mean, like. Oh, more, more, way more. Um, so yeah, he was, he was getting, yeah, he was, uh, at the time there was not a single, there was no restaurants, there was no bars, there was nobody living. It was a, a ghost town of warehouses and industrial. Those buildings were all industrial. So you'd have makers, you'd have a print shop, you'd have uh, it, stainers, I mean, all these old professions, and they were operating on different floors of these industrial buildings. And he would find derelict ones, they would renovate the entire floor and convert it into a loft apartment and then they would rent them out and then he would do it to a lot of artists because artists would use the front of their studio they live in the back and they like that warehouse feel they like the other people who were kind of hands-on who didn't mind a little bit initially like a really grimy vibe so all these artists moved in and that became a cooler neighborhood um one restaurant opened a second restaurant opened and he was one of the pioneers who kind of converted soho from being just these abandoned warehouses into what it is today and it's he like had a mini, uh, it's like a major scale what fit happened to Fishtown, like in Philadelphia, yeah, and 12 years ago, like on a way grander scale. Like, Fishtown was just warehouses like 10, 12 years ago, so that's an appreciation play, right? Like, you hear about New York all the time, 
and how it took off. And it's just, it's so incredible to hear. You're almost learning a little bit of history and how it was kind of came to how it came. Well, they talk about not only that, but like even in Philly, like old city 20, Mm -hmm. 25 years ago was literally like, you would call it a slump. Like it was, it was abandoned. And now you can't buy a property in there. I think Soho is like maybe the biggest example of that. Like you can't go to you can't buy it in Soho like anymore. Like you can if you're if you're a a, a major investor, but like right. that's you, an, you, so that it, that's awesome. If you're thinking long term enough, most medium to large cities will have that story if they haven't had them already. So I mean, like you you, you obviously know Philly. Um, I think in Philly, I I've, I've got laughed at by a broker there because I was really interested in Strawberry Mansion. And he was like, here, look at the profile. I don't think you know what you're talking about. And I was like, no, 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 look at the, where it is on a map. Look what's to its left, look what's to its right, look what's below it. Yep. It's a pocket. And that's, I mean, that happens all over. That happened in Brooklyn. And that's kind of where I guess I'll transition. That's where I got in. So whenever I, but that happens all over the place, especially whenever we first transitioned to Austin, uh, my father said, find, find warehouses on the outskirts of the city, like immediately outside the main downtown, where's the industrial area? buy a warehouse if, if and just and you can just hold on to it like if you can do that in in your market wherever that is it's different everywhere in austin they didn't really have that so that's not what we did here but over time as cities grow those areas will become highly desirable because you have space for creative businesses you have art galleries can move in there you have creative spaces that can move in you can have breweries that can move in there or you can convert it into um so apartments, I mean, that's what all those warehouses in Soho, it's apartments upstairs and then beautiful retail downstairs. That's um, incredible. So, just, to, can you provide the audience a little bit of context of your portfolio? Um, you mentioned yeah. Austin, you mentioned New York, just like the types of properties, how many you have and, and you grew up in the real estate game, right? So that's kind of the story of your background, like your father. Yeah, was I was very, so go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so he had uh, those properties. He, uh, he, he was, uh, went into a depressive state after my mother died and sold all of his buildings in New York at the bottom of the market in the late 80s. Oh, wow. Um, and then he lived off of that. He had a co-op that would not allow him to sell his building in Soho. It was his last one. And that's it. That was the only one that he held on to. So whenever I was growing up, I would visit that space with him. And he still had all these friends in real estate. So I grew up with him. And he was essentially retired off of that whenever I was growing up. But I would go to various buildings. My uncle also had real estate in New York. So he had a bunch of buildings on the Upper West Side and Midtown. So I would go with him and I'd be around real estate then asking questions. As a 10-year-old, as a 12-year-old, he would just, we'd go to the park and then he'd go, oh, hold on one second. And then we would walk two blocks and he'd go up and meet with tenants and he'd check stuff out. And I'd help him like hold a bucket while he would do some repairs. And then we'd go back to the park together. So I was around it a lot. I got to ask a lot of questions, see that lifestyle that it provided for my uncle and for my dad. And then in 2013, I had the one piece of uh, one floor in Soho that he bought in 1969. And he bought it for, I think, $60,000. He ended up selling it for $9.75 million, And we used that to buy... <laughs> The long-term appreciation of real estate, obviously Soho is an exception, but still. How many years was that? I'm sorry. 67 to 2013. Okay. So you're talking like, I don't know, quick math. It's like around 50 years, right? Yes. 50 years went from $60,000 to $9.7 million. That was only the the first floor in the basement. The apartments upstairs, he didn't own. He owned the the first floor retail space and the downstairs on Prince Prince Street. Power of real estate. I mean, seriously. If you buy so, the path of progress like that. And like, mm-hmm. like you said, your dad was a smart guy. He may have known, but there's also people who like may not know and then fall into that. I think it's like we buy for cash flow, but that appreciation right. is how you build generational wealth. I mean, that's. I would, yeah. I, I, I want to talk about appreciation for sure. I mean, that's why we transitioned out of that. And so then in 2013, we sold that one and we bought with that one space, we bought four buildings in Brooklyn that are, um, in Fort Greene, Gowanus, and Borham Hill, and they're all corner buildings except for one of, yeah, except for one of them. So they're all corner spaces because we have commercial on the ground floor and then residential upstairs. So it kind of diversifies the portfolio of what kind of tenants we can get and whether there's an upturn or downturn in the market, just gives you a little more diversification. Um, so those four buildings in Brooklyn have four commercial units. We have a restaurant, a coffee shop, and a uh, toy store, and then a mix of studios, one bedrooms and two bedrooms upstairs. So I managed, I, whenever I first got into real estate, that was the first kind of task that I had with the business. 
Um, my father said, I want to sell this, uh, this space on, on Prince Street. Sorry, Spring Street, not Prince, Spring, Spring Street. And um, I want to transition it somewhere else in New York. So I spent two months riding my bike up and down, just blocks and blocks and blocks in the Bronx and in Astoria and in Brooklyn, just to see which neighborhood um, to really familiarize myself with every single block in a neighborhood I would want to invest in. And the best piece of real estate advice that I think my dad's ever given me is that you should only invest somewhere that you would be willing to live. Because if you do that, one, you can live there if you need to, but two, you're more likely to be present with the, the transaction. You're more likely to be present with the building itself. You don't mind going to that neighborhood. You can identify with the tenants. You understand why they want to live there or why they want to set up shop there for a period of time. Uh, so you're getting more desirable properties. And again, it's not getting emotionally involved with it, but it's just realizing that that neighborhood has potential for some reason. And if you like it right from the beginning, that's better than saying, well, I think this is a good money play on paper, but again, that's more appreciation. If the more desirable it is, the more it'll appreciate over time. Um, because other people will probably think so it's desirable as well. To, to, I guess, bring this puzzle together here. So your, mm -hmm. your father was a really smart man. He got you involved in real estate at a young age. So you, you were savvy from a young age and you knew it was a great thing. So mm -hmm. I, I want to tie in your financial independence philosophy into your portfolio. I don't know if we got to act the actual numbers in your portfolio, but we can say that you have a bunch of residential units, uh, mm -hmm. a number of commercial units. So you kind of are playing in both games. Mm -hmm. Your dad, like your dad set you in a good position and you've taken it to another level. What, why real estate? And we talked about appreciation, but why real estate and mm -hmm. how does financial independence, your perspective for that tie in? Um, so real estate is, in my opinion, the best way to grow long-term passive income. I don't know of another vehicle where somebody else will pay you to own an asset while the asset is going up in value. It's such a high rate. I mean, you can get dividends on a stock, you can get 2% or 3%, that's great. But the amount of money that rent pays so that you can own the underlying asset with essentially the bank's money, so you borrow somebody else's money and then somebody else pays you to own that asset, while all the while, assuming the, you know, the long-term trend of the market, rents will gradually go up over time, the building's value will go up over time, and when that is paid off, then it's, then it's not, not free money, but you're getting, um, clear. you're getting paid to just continue to hold this asset at a higher rate than any other vehicle that I know of. Um, and then you can have, I mean, so what we've done now is, to, again, jumping around a bit, we transitioned into Austin so that we could be exposed to two markets. Uh, but so then, Initially, I managed everything in New York for about four years. I knew every nook and cranny in the building, every piece of infrastructure, I understood it. And then we hired a day-to-day -day property manager for the maintenance who I could communicate with, you know, with the knowledge of understanding what it means if the boiler in 510 goes down because I've been replacing that for four years or fixing it, maintaining it. So you can hire a property manager there. And as long as you have these real estate assets, they continue to just produce income for you while the underlying asset continues to grow over time. It's an excellent vehicle. Awesome, awesome. So I guess um, we, we oftentimes share our real estate investing strategies here and clearly you're in a good spot. Mm -hmm. But Ryan and I, being that we're, we have small portfolios, we always like to buy for cash flow. And we have numbers mm -hmm. we've talked about, we're, uh, we're getting in the process of buying properties together. We, we look at a specific cash flow number we think mm -hmm. you know three to five hundred dollars a month in cash flow is great, right? Depending upon the cash mm -hmm. on cash return. But I've talked to you in the past, and because you, you're so accustomed to the appreciation, you've said things like, "Corey, I'll buy a property that breaks even on cash flow." And mm -hmm. I always thought that was interesting. You might be in a different financial spot than me, but I wonder. I just wonder if you could share with people what your philosophy is on that in terms of why you buy a place that breaks even. Is it? And I guess it, it, I'll let you answer the question. Sure. I think whenever you're getting started in real estate, you, you have to buy for cash flow. Otherwise it becomes too risky. That's how you can kind of get caught. So, you know, if you get caught where you're behind on payments every month because you're not getting cash flow, that's a very risky position. And I wouldn't advise um, that to be kind of your out of the gate strategy, unless you have money that you're willing to burn initially, but then it becomes a lot more speculative. I think a more conservative um, strategy from the beginning is to go for cash flow. But now let's say, hypothetically, if you get to the point where you have, you're generating 
I don't know, 5,000 free cash flow on the initial properties that you have. And you know that that's going to be coming in pretty consistently. Now you have this cash flow that can fund an investment in necessarily a better neighborhood that has a higher chance to appreciate because it's in a more desirable location. So if you wanted to buy something, let's say now in Fishtown or now in downtown Philly, to use your market as an example, or I mean, again, if we're talking high value places, if you can say like San Francisco or New York or yeah. DC or London, those places we can assume will appreciate greatly over time because they're so desirable for world economy and for as population grows, people will want to live there. But you can't find places that are going to cash flow out the gate there. So the only way that you can compete in that market is you have to be able to accept lower cash flow. So we're fortunate that we have such, um, such equity in the properties initially that you know, we can make those, those numbers work. But if you're starting and you're bootstrapping and you're, and you're, you're you know, financing your deals and these are generating small amounts of free cash flow, and that's how this becomes a vehicle so that you have passive income and so that you can become financially independent, initially free cash flow is king. Absolutely. But once you hit a certain point where you can then say, okay, I have these five fringe areas that are generating this free cash flow for me. This is excellent. I'm getting that extra money. I'm saving that. And you can say, okay, great. This can fund a premium asset in a premium neighborhood. And if initially, let's say the first year, two, three, or four, I'm breaking even, which means a bad year or a bad month, a big repair might, might hurt my online. But I, I know I can fund that. I have money coming in that can maintain that for me. After five or six years, rent will probably increase. You will probably add value to the building over that time, which is why, why the rent will increase. The building will appreciate because once you have those higher value assets, if the building appreciate, if you're losing, let's say one or $200 a month, but the building is worth, uh, you know, multiple six figures, 500,000, 600,000, 700,000. If it goes up just a couple percent, you've maybe lost $2,000 that year, but your appreciation has gone up 50,000. Wow. So let me recap this. I think Rai has a question. I'm going to let him jump in here, mm -hmm. but let me recap this. What you're saying is, is if you're just starting out, somebody like Rai and I, or somebody, so maybe some of our other audience members, in order to get yeah. the snowball rolling, you have to buy for cash flow, right? You can't lose money on deals. But what you're saying right. is if you get yourself, you use $5,000 a month as an example. If you get yourself to a, a nice position where you can sustain your lifestyle, you're saying at that point, it might be beneficial for you to dive in and say, I can afford to take more risks and buy a property that doesn't cash flow right off the bat if I think the appreciation is going to give me some home runs in the long term. Is that, is that what you would? Um, yeah, I think that, that's, that's pretty accurate. Yeah. I mean, right now, if you want to, if Austin is a great example as I'm here. So I see this market all the time. If you want to buy near downtown in South Austin or immediate chase in East Austin, minimum prices on homes is 350 to a million dollars. And none of them will cash flow out the gate. It's just not going to happen. But if you assume that you can, maybe you can get an older house too and you can add value to it. And that if, if you would have bought any of these properties in South Austin, again, hindsight's 2020, but five years ago, you would have not had any cash flow whatsoever. And today your asset would have gone up 50 to 100%. So you maybe lost 1,000 to $5,000 a year, but you just made 200,000 over two to three years on that type of asset. So incredible. So my question definitely piggybacks off of this. How do you, you know, we have a lot of young investors and beginner investors here as an as audience members. How does someone that is interested in getting in the game, get in the game specifically when looking at deals? Like for you, how do you analyze and find deals that you know, hey, listen, this is a market I definitely want to jump into? Um, I really like to ride a bicycle and I go up and down every single block and I learn what block makes this one better than the next one. You can see based on proximity to a good grocery store, proximity to public transit, proximity to a body of water, proximity to a park. So then when you are looking at a map later online or you get a listing, it's not just a ping on a grid. You know, oh, that's okay. That's next to that park, but that's a great park. Or that's next to that park, but that's not, not such a nice park because you know that neighborhood like the back of your hand. So I start larger. So whenever we left New York, it was, we had to pick a market. So I went to San Diego, um, Santa Fe, Miami, and Austin. And out of those four, we narrowed it to Austin. Uh, again, location is based on where would you want to live? I loved 
the, I loved everything about Austin and the real estate looked great there. Then once I was in Austin, I did the same thing and you pick neighborhoods and then you narrow it down. And then once you get to that region, then you narrow it down further. So you say, okay, this is the small pocket that I believe is the most desirable, best of breed for that city, for that region. And it just gets smaller and smaller. And that can be done financially because you know that this pocket is nice and it cash flows well, or you just think that the lifestyle and the beauty of the neighborhood is whatever it may be. But for your criteria, you know, you guys have both have different criteria than I do. The three of us will have different criteria than your listeners, but for your criteria, really narrow it down and then know that neighborhood, like the back of your hand, know every listing that comes up, go up and down. The first deal I got was based on, a broker putting a sign into the front yard with a stake and mallet before it was listed online because I happened to be biking by. And I said, can I see it? It wasn't listed yet. I went in, I put an offer down same day for the asking price and we signed the deal within 24 hours, signed the contract. And then for the next month until we closed, they were calling me asking if I wanted to get out of it because they had received offers so much higher, but I happened to be at the right place at the right time. Wow. Um, yeah. Would you say the majority of your deals are found based off relationships as opposed to the MLS or, you know, any websites that you might find yes. a deal on? Yes. Yeah. I've either found them by uh, calling, calling numbers that I've seen for for sale by owners. Um, that's another one I got here in Austin. It was just for sale by owner. And I met with the, the owner once a week for three months until he agreed to sell to me. And that was just relationship with the, with the seller. Um, and then I have uh, one person in a, uh, here in Austin, uh, I'll just call her M. She is fantastic to work with. She is an independent broker. She does not work with the company. So she is very flexible because she doesn't have to meet quote every month. Um, and she has relationships all over the city. She knows people doing so many different types of deals. Um, and she knows what my criteria is. She knows what I'm looking for. She knows what my, uh, I guess what my position is in terms of what I need to finance and what cash I have on hand. And if she sees something, she doesn't badger me because she knows, you know, I'm not trying to buy something tomorrow, but if something comes up and she thinks of me and we talk uh, every couple of weeks, we'll just check in with one another and she'll send things my way. And she knows that if the opportunity knocks, I'm willing to act because she's moving things relatively quickly. Opportunity does yeah. not knock twice. Uh, again, if I would have waited a day on that property that I was driving by, it would not have been available. They would have gotten multiple offers. We just looked at um, one. <laughs> we just found, saw one that we were interested in the other day, and it would. We were looking at the numbers, like this actually looks pretty, pretty decent. Maybe we should go on. Put an offer. Mm -hmm. Sold the day before. Yeah. Brutal. Yeah. Yeah. It. That's you, you have to have your your spreadsheets. I mean, I have mine. I'm happy to share them if you want to put them in the the notes or whatever for people. I'm happy yeah. to share them. But I have multiple spreadsheets that I use so that if Mary, oh. Oh, that's not her point. Anyway, she sends me something. Uh, <laughs> she sends me something within. You can say ten... Mary. We don't know what Mary. Does that's yeah, it's not. It's not a whole name. Anyway, if, but uh, if she she sends it to me. Then within ten minutes, I can do like a full analysis by just plugging in a few numbers. But again, because I already know that neighborhood, so I can just do a Google Map search, know the neighborhood. If these numbers work, then at least at the very least, within twenty four hours, we should be able to make a, a move on it. So if we're not, if it's a good deal, yeah, if it's a good deal, it will be gone. As you know, I mean, like there's, yeah, there's, and that's what happened to us. And Ryan, so competitive now. Ryan and I just talked about like you know purchasing properties together, and I think that we're learning on how to analyze. And yeah, you have to you have to move quick, and we're we're learning that the hard way. But 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 that's good. I mean, that's more that's, deals will come though. That's the thing. It's hyper competitive right now. But yeah. and for people who say in real estate too, I talk to a lot of people, and they say, oh, I'll, I'll never get another deal like that one, or oh, it's so unique, so I'll never be able to like reproduce that. Things like that, I hear that so often that I know nothing is a, is a one-off thing. Yeah. Like I had that one because I was going by, a friend of mine knew a guy who was in a thing, he said, oh, I'll never find something else like that again. Yeah, you will. <laughs> like, things things come up. Relationships. Exactly, because right. if you have relationships, if you help other people, people think of you, and it definitely comes back around. So people will reach out to you. That transitioning from New York to Austin, how did you build your team? I'm sure people are interested, like they're like, hey, listen, I might not be able to get into the Philadelphia, the New York market, they're too pricey mm -hmm. for me, but I can, I see cheaper, cheaper get in prices out of state. I'm interested in going out there. How would one build their team and then, you know, jump into that market that might be a little cheaper to get into? Um, the reach out to multiple people that you could work on on the initial deal, whether that's a broker or if it's a lender, whoever it is, and really wait and be patient until you find somebody that you trust, you get along with, and you think is good at what they do. And again, that 
this M. She was one of my first real estate contacts here. I loved working with her. She's a hustler. She, she works really hard. She knows the city so well. She's a great communicator and she has great referrals. And so once you find out one person, ask for referrals and they won't all be great. But again, if you say, you know, who do you know that's an accountant? Who do you know that's an attorney? Who do you know that lends money here? Who's the good contractor? And then you kind of just build through referrals and referrals and referrals through the best people that you've worked with. And if there's somebody that you don't like working with, don't be afraid to, I mean, I've gone through multiple, multiple different professionals and contractors here. And then when you find one and it sticks, then you find that you found it and then you're good to go. I mean, in New York, whenever I left New York, we transitioned and it took a while initially to find a really good property manager. But after you get through a couple and you find one person, don't be afraid to sever a relationship if it's not what you want to get out of it. Because the longer that that maintains, it'll spend more time, more money, and things won't be run as smoothly as they can. Cool. So it sounds like you, I mean, we're, we're kind of like painting this picture for you. So you grew up in the real estate game. You, you've built a portfolio with your father in New York. You've built, now mm -hmm. built a portfolio in Austin. Um, I'm wondering what your, what your plans are for the future. Because it sounds like that you, you're doing real estate. This is your full-time job. I don't know if you, did you ever have yeah. a nine to five? Like, did you ever do? Oh something? yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what yeah, I yeah. want to know. Share like, your story. Share, your, share a little bit about like how you transitioned from your nine to five into, um, you know, just full-time real estate. Cause I think that's, that's, you know, interesting. Um, but growing up, I knew, I, I always knew that I wanted to eventually uh, do real estate. Like I grew up watching my dad and my uncle and I just, as a kid, I saw other kids' parents working nine to fives. And then my uncle would be like, let's, you know, go to the museum on a Tuesday. And I remember thinking, what do you do? Like, what do you do? Like, how, how is this a thing that you can do as yeah. an adult? And I remember thinking, I just want to do that. I love like your flexibility, yep. you know, still working, still making money, but he has the flexibility to kind of live life how he wanted to. Um, so I knew that that was the end goal for sure. Um, after I went to small liberal arts college, um, I'm not pro or against that. I have no beliefs about how college is these days. You can look that up on YouTube, figure out for yourself. Um, but after college, I moved to the Caribbean. I managed a scuba diving resort for a couple of years. I wanted to become so wait, awesome. that's probably where they met. No, they oh. met. They oh met. no. <laughs> Let him this tell is, us. Let him tell us. You, well, <laughs> well, with that story. So here's it. Finish that story and then tell us sure. how you met. Go ahead. So yeah, um, I was a scuba diving resort that I went to whenever I was, every summer as a kid, I would just go down there and I would stay there um, for the summer months and I would just work. I would just haul tanks. I would clean rooms just so I, I had a Caribbean vacation every year and I got fluent in Spanish, which I thought was really valuable from a young age. So I did that. And then um, I met a Japanese girl. I moved to Tokyo and I was a car salesman in Tokyo what the uh, fuck? for a couple of years. That's wild. <laughs> yeah, but uh, and I would recommend that if you if you are looking for a, a nine to five, sales is great. Sales teaches you a lot about how to deal with people. Um, it's not a shysty business. If you're honest, you can be a very good salesman. Uh, it, it gets a bad rep, but sales was an excellent experience. Going into real estate, not as a real I'm not a real estate salesperson, but just in dealing with tenants and dealing with contractors, having that experience working in car sales was invaluable. It was an excellent experience. Did you use that money from the car sales? Did you, did you save a lot of your money and stockpile yeah. it for your investments? Yes. Yeah. Whenever, yeah. Whenever I came back, uh, the first property that I bought in Austin, uh, my father acquired that I bought that for myself so that I could have that experience of not using the equity from New York, um, from the, the old business, but actually just doing one deal entirely on my own initially. Uh, so that was all of my money there funded that. And I have a mortgage on that. Yeah. Um, after that, I moved back to New York and I worked for a property management company. That's whenever I knew I was going to transition. So I got a job with a New York city property management company. Wait, I worked with them for two years that taught me how to, I mean, that really taught me the ins and the outs on that side, not on the, the office side of real estate management, but just the, the day to day maintenance, dealing with contractors, dealing with tenants, going to calls, fixing broken windows, dealing with landmark commission, dealing with violations, going to the city for permits. Uh, but I did that while getting paid for it by a property management company. So I did that for a few years and then I managed our own properties in New York. Um, yeah. Then moved to, uh, the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. And then started doing it in Austin. And now we have, uh, and so now we're this summer, we'll be doing a major refinance of the properties in New York and then we'll expand into a third market either in Philly or, 
uh, we're really watching closely what happens with the currency market and uh, we'd love to get into London. That's kind of our next play because then we can have multiple currencies in multiple countries and protection. Um, yeah, so uh, that's just really cool. Makes us a little London more flexible. Port. Beautiful. Love it over there. Yeah. So real quick, the, how did you and Sam meet? Is it, it's a pretty funny story. I, I mean, I don't want to, oh, yeah. I, but it's, it's really funny. Cause like you were talking, we've about talked it about it twice. Yeah. We, we need to hear this. <laughs> uh, my childhood mentor in New York, his name was Milos. He was from uh, former Yugoslavia. He left during the civil war, moved to New York, became good friends with my dad. And so I grew up and he was kind of uh, an adult figure who I always looked up to. And we became very, very close friends. We still are very close friends. He organized a trip to his motherland, Croatia, on a sailing trip for two weeks. Since I was in Honduras, I can captain a boat. I'm really comfortable in sailboats. So I was kind of the first mate on, on this trip that he did for two weeks with people he knows from all over the world. And he gathered uh, pairs of two people from all over and put all 10 of us on a boat for two weeks together. And I became really good friends with this couple on the boat named Neil and Julie. And they were from Philadelphia. They told me their daughter lives in New York. And I was like, yeah, okay, everybody has a daughter in New York. That's great. <laughs> uh, we came back, to, came back to New York City. They went to Philly. About a month and a half later, they came to New York to see their daughter's show. She was a costume designer on, um, well, some on Broadway, some off Broadway. It's just costume designer in New York. So they came to one of her shows. And they said, oh, we'd love to meet up with you, have a little reunion from the boat. Well, our daughter's going to come afterwards. And that daughter is Sam Jacobson. We've been together now for five and a half years. I'm um, still really good friends with Neil and Julie. Um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. yeah. No, that is, uh, it's a funny story. It's like an international like relationship Real how they met up, right? So um, cool. I want to transition because I, clearly you're at a point in your real estate portfolio where you're looking to expand. And I think that you mm -hmm. have a really good grasp on that and um you know, how it provides you the lifestyle that you live. You're able to live in different places because of what a real estate has done. I want to talk to you about your financial independence philosophy and like why real estate, why real estate, I mean, we talked about why, but like you, you're a big proponent on time management and like, you know, and looking at your time as your most valuable asset. So if you could just expand on that a little bit. Yeah. And we've talked about this before. I believe that, you know, time is a, a non-renewable resource. It is, you only, you only have so much in your life and nobody knows how much that is. Yeah. Um, so if you spend all of it working, whatever that is, uh, you don't get to enjoy all of the other beautiful aspects of life. Um, so real estate for me is very fun. There's so many different sides of it. So even, you know, one day if I feel like mowing a lawn, I do most of my own landscaping here in Austin. It's because I like being outside, I like gardening. So if, you know, if that's what I'm in the mood to do because of real estate, my job, my day job can be gardening. My day job can also be sending emails, phone calls, and building relationships. My day job can be playing with numbers and spreadsheets and finance. So I kind of can shift. And I really, if there's a hard deadline, then of course, hard deadline comes first. You know, if, if it's tax day and I haven't sent in my tax stuff yet, that's what I have to do, whether I want to or not. But you have um, flexibility, right? And that's exactly. But yeah, whenever, yeah, I, I kind of have... I set lists for the day for hard deadlines, but then if there's something that needs to happen this week, if I can slot that in because I want to do it on Tuesday afternoon, that's whenever it's going to happen. But I'm not being forced to do anything that I don't want to do most of the time. <laughs> You're asking about um, how real estate gets you into financial independence. Yeah, just your philosophy on on financial independence too, and like how you evaluate your time. You were talking about how sure. you were loving how some, some one of the adults that you hung out with was able to go to the museum on a, on a Tuesday and you could garden and yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. So, you know, with real estate, you're fortunate that there's, it's so varied in from day to day. There's the financial side, there's the relationship side, there's the legal side. There, I mean, there's so many balls in the air, but what that also does give you the flexibility to do is decide on a daily basis, kind of where your priorities are both professionally and personally. So, and I, I'm a big proponent of batching. Um, so especially with emails and with phone calls, um, I love to not be constantly refreshing my email all day and be a slave to being on the computer and checking emails throughout the day. I very much like picking a time for maybe about an hour in the morning and one hour in the evening. And that's it. Those are the times that I respond to emails and reply to emails. Unless it's something really pressing, but typically I can do those in the morning. And then that way I have the rest of the day where I don't have to worry about them because I know that the emails will come in. And I know that I will get to them at some point that evening or the next day. 
I like to think a lot about, again, I'm lucky that my father did this. How was business done in like high level real estate 25 years ago before email, before cell phones? Yeah. Business. No, because you're happen. expected to answer people within 10 <laughs> seconds today. It's like, um, it's unbelievable. But if you don't, chances are it'll be okay. <laughs> the exactly. expectation. And the expectation. that's a great mindset tool for people because you, you've set up your life in a, in a scenario where you're saying, look, if I don't answer this email today, life will go on tomorrow. I'm not going yeah. to be a slave to my computer. And I think that's important for people to know is because once you get out of that rat race and we keep talking about the rat race, real estate can get you out of it where you can buy your time back. And now you have time to say, I still have to do work if I want to build my mm -hmm. portfolio, but right. I can answer emails for an hour in the morning. I can answer on your own schedule. Morning. Yeah, on your schedule. That's really. I mean, we have over over thirty units total, and uh, I learned this whenever I was doing property management. If you are a slave to all of them, you will be running around with a ch like a chicken with your head cut off, because there's always going to be something, whether it's a lock that doesn't work, or whether it's something from your attorney, you know, big or small. If all of them get equal weight on your time and when that is allowed to ping you, then you lose all control over when you are ready when you're capable when you're best suited to take care of any given task do you um, manage all of these properties yourself or do you have property managers currently in place we have a a maintenance property manager in new york so he handles all the day-to-day -day maintenance again that's you know if there's a broken window if a lock doesn't work if somebody leaves trash out that's mm -hmm. the day-to-day -day property management um i handle all the financial and all the leasing all of that stuff in New York. We have a broker who handles like the lease transitions and showings in New York. Uh, I do everything day to day here in Austin. Um, Cause in Austin we only have one, two, three, four. We have five total properties with uh, seven units. So in Austin, I still do it myself. Uh, that's small enough that I don't mind doing that. And that's kind of how I uh, like pay my own personal bills as I pay myself is basically with my personal management fee off of that. And any additional income just gets spun into being able to purchase more property in the future. So you pay yourself um, a salary off that is what you're saying, so, sort of. I do, based okay. off of the, the management of, yeah, portion of the management in New York and then the management of the ones here in Austin. That's pretty cool. Yeah, right that's, my, that's, my, that's my salary and I, it's, it's very strict too. I mean, I, you know, if there's a, a very good month, I'm not taking more. If there's yep. a bad month or a vacancy, I'm not taking less. I treat myself very much as, a, as an employee to my own business. Um, and that's, and I don't live above those means or necessarily below them. And even with that, I budget that. And that's what goes into funding my IRA. That's what goes into funding my HSA. That's all based off of my personal salary. So you're not strictly a couple, I have a bunch of questions here, but mm -hmm. you're not strictly investing in real estate. You have a, a portfolio, an investment portfolio in other sectors, correct? Uh, yeah. I'm yeah. Yeah. It's stocks and yeah, mostly stocks. Yeah. Cool. And I'm wondering if you can give us a quick snapshot, two minutes or less, your favorite deal that you've recently been a part of, what type of property it is, how you found it, um, how much cash flows, et cetera, and, and why you love it so much. Um, Put you on the spot. Uh, no, that's fine. Um, in, so I'll just use Austin. So we've done, we haven't done any deals in New York in a while, but I am a big fan of duplexes here in Austin. Yep. I would recommend a lot of people who are buying their first place. They think, Oh, it's gotta be single family. Cause that's attainable. Mm -hmm. Going to a duplex is not that much different. It's still under one roof. It's typically still on one lot and it cash flows a lot better in my opinion, in my markets. Um, if you have a vacancy, you're only vacant for half at a time instead of taking a full vacancy on the entire property. Um, you can do be flexible and like we have one duplex here that's an Airbnb and it's a rental. We have another duplex that we live in and the other side is an Airbnb. So it gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, awesome. yeah, we purchased uh, the last duplex. We got two, two ones. Uh, we got it for, I think it was 400, 380,000. It's probably valued about 450 now. We bought it three years ago and, um, yeah, the vacancy, if we ever have it, it's only one month on one side. So the numbers work really, really well. We do cash, it, it, again, talking about appreciation, we cash flow positive on our duplexes in Austin. We don't on our single families. Interesting. Gotcha. Because you're so confident in the Austin market that you know, when do you anticipate the cash flow being cash flow positive then? If you're, you have to have those metrics, I'm sure, right? Yes. So the one property we don't because we bought it, that was really speculative. It requires permitting from the city and dealing with the city and permits and moving storm drains and whatnot takes years. So once those storm drains moved and then we can we'll take a loan for construction, that'll be the first one we actually develop. 
we typically buy older, mildly distressed properties. We add the value ourselves and then we rent it out for long term. That's, I guess I didn't get to that earlier, but that's really the strategy is buying something that was built in Austin between 1950 and 1975. And then that's been mildly neglected. Uh, it, the, the uglier the house is from the outside, the better, because a lot of home buyers won't be interested, but you can really make a property attractive quickly if the bones are still good. And then you can raise the rents on that. And then you'll be able to uh, add the value yourself instead of paying a premium for a house flipper or a contractor who does that work for you. You can just oversee it. And, so awesome. Thank you. You, mm -hmm. you are a young, successful entrepreneur that I'm sure a lot of people are going to take to listening to this episode. I'm wondering if you can share with us a few resources that you use specifically like programs, books, et cetera, that help you run your real estate empire, because there's a lot of people that are going to probably want to write things down and, and maybe take a, a page out of your book. Yeah. Um, for the financial side, get a really good flexible spreadsheet that you can just plug numbers into quickly. Again, I'm happy to share the one that I got. I got mine off of uh, the bigger pockets like years ago yep. and I've adjusted it over a couple years just to suit what we do a little bit better and make it, you know, make more sense for the, for exactly how we're looking at valuing properties, but just for incomes and expenses and long-term extrapolations on those. Uh, so really good spreadsheets are really, really valuable. And then other than that, listen to, I, I consume so much audio media. I think invest in Bluetooth headphones and yeah, that way you can, right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, invest in Bluetooth headphones. That way, um, if I do get a call, I also take every phone call that I get if I have my phone on me um, and available because you never, I get calls from unknown numbers. You never know who they'll be. They could be people who have a deal. They could be people who want to move in your apartment. They saw something. You never know who will potentially call. And if you don't want to hear it, just say, I'm so sorry. I can't take this right now. And then you can get off real quick, but take every call. Because if you have Bluetooth headphones, it makes it really easy. Um, and then while you're doing that, um, I consume a lot of audio media. Um, you can listen to, there's so many good podcasts out there. You're one of them. Your podcast is excellent. There's, uh, <laughs> no, it's very, very good. Oh, not taking that call. Oh, Every call. Um, it. Yeah. <laughs> I knew that was from, that said, that said who that was from. That, that, that would have, that's got, oh, you want that, to that, that was not an unknown, that was not an unknown number. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, that's that was yeah, someone's listening to us. That's great. Yeah. But, uh, and then, I mean, I, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. Again, talking about like the, the, the freedom too. I go on a lot of walks with my dog. I ride my bike a lot. I go to the park and play pickup soccer. On the way there and back, if I'm driving somewhere for an errand, I'm listening to a podcast or an audiobook. So the more you can listen to or read, I mean, essentially reading just with your ears, uh, the better. Um, I would recommend. Real quick. Yeah. We do. So our our kind of one of our last segments of the show is geared towards resources and what it's, called? Mm -hmm. it's called the last drop. Yeah, let's go. The All last right. drop, get it. Juice drop. Let's get it. Yeah. Like your cup's almost empty. It's the last drop. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you can give three precise exact programs or book suggestions that you use on a daily basis that someone can go download buy, or uh, take advantage of. I think you them. mentioned bigger pockets. I mean, that's a good but yeah, I'm not going to count that one. If you're if you're listening to this realist, I mean your listeners have got to know bigger pockets. So they don't. That's a freebie. Rather than listen um, to us, but not nah, just kidding. Bigger pockets is amazing. The more you can listen, to, the better. <laughs> Again, yeah, uh, sure. I would say there's an excellent, excellent um, podcast called The Daily Stoic. Um, I listen to that every morning. Perfect. It's three to five minutes. It's really, really quick. Very. Uh, it's a great. I don't meditate. I should. I've had a hard time picking up that habit, but. Listening to that is kind of my substitute. I'll count that. Um, it's an excellent way to just frame your mind around more than just real estate, but kind of just life in general. Yeah, uh, I think that's great. Um, uh, another book is recently I read Atomic Habits. Okay, um, I've heard of this. What, what is that? Oh, it's about? fantastic. Yeah, uh, it's just about the small changes that you can make so that you can set up for larger habits over yeah. time. Um, that's essentially uh, the, the cliff and version of that. Um, and other than that, um, okay. Third, uh, the the maybe the company that you use for your property management, like we hear cozy all the time. I'm wondering if that's or the, the platform. Yeah. Platform, Do you sorry. use like a? Um, no, it's a it's an individual, so it's one guy. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, and I'm not going to share him because then he's not going to want to manage mine anymore. He's in New York. <laughs> though. Um, uh, I would say I would say the third thing is really find some. Oh, okay. Here, the third thing would be 
find something that uh, is worth putting work down for that you really look forward to doing and value your time doing that. So don't shortchange yourself on uh, putting off things that you really, really enjoy and want to do because you don't think you have time for it. You do have time for your priorities. So whether that's uh, time with your family, whether that's playing a sport that you love, whether that's building a relationship with someone or something, don't be afraid to carve out intentional time to do that every day. And when that happens, when that time comes, hard cut off and really focus on that priority because you always have time to work a little bit more, but you won't always have time to play with your kids, to play that extra game of soccer, to walk your dog and spend time outside. So really figure out what your priorities are, whether it's working out, whatever it may be for you and stick to that. And you can always, you can always work later. It's almost like the, the, the pay yourself first kind of thing. Too. Yeah. But with time, exactly. It's pay yourself first, but do it with time. Yeah. You have time. You have time to do the things you want to do, but also Mm -hmm. Real estate puts you in a position, the type of real estate that you're doing, you know, long-term appreciation, also buying for cash flow, that type of real estate has put you in a position to say, I'm taking my time back. And like, mm-hmm. nobody's taking that from me. Doesn't mean you don't work hard. Doesn't mean you don't get things done, but you get it done on your terms. And I think that that's like, that is, if that's, that's a nugget that I think people will take from you um, and, and it can use it in, in anything that they want to do personally. People will be surprised how much they can get done if they spend the time that they're working foc- doing focused work. There's the third one. Uh, Tim Ferriss' first book, um, the five hour, the four hour work week, yeah. is fantastic. I mean, it's shocking how much you can get done in four hours a day. He scrimps down to four hours a week, but a four hour work day is a great goal to start with. So how can you fit what you're doing now into a smaller chunk of time by being more efficient? It's more possible than a lot of people think. It's a lot of time wasted just making busy work for yourself. Absolutely. I mean, this, first of all, this episode has been like eye opening because you know, you, you've created a life for yourself that you want to live. And that's, I think, take all the real estate out of it. I mean, that's how you got there, but that's the most Mm -hmm. important aspect. And that's what we love the most. I think you want to, yeah, he's, I just like that. You've shown a lot of risk, right? You talked about going down and living and working in the Caribbean. Um, during your summers. Then you also talk about moving to Tokyo and being a car salesman out there just to push your dreams forward when you came back to New York to build your own real estate empire and buy your own property and and set your own path. And I just think that's admirable. Um, And I think you're never going to regret those risks that you take. Like you're never going to look back. Oh, Oh, for sure. Right. Like (laughs) I mean, the the same is last episode. They were talking about, you know, really going for something, especially if your listeners are, are younger um, the, the, the time is on your side if you're younger. So you have the, the time in the books to be able to take those risks. And I don't want it to be lost. I'm very, very fortunate that I got to inherit a decent amount of equity. Yeah. So that is definitely there. I don't, <laughs> but, yeah, no, but at the same time, you recognize you're also recognize yourself aware. I mean, that's important too. Like I say it all the time. Like I'm fortunate to have the life that I do have. I just want to build mm-hmm. on it and make it better. And I never take any of that for granted. So I, I'm glad that you're, that you're willing to, you know, go there with that. I think, this episode has been awesome. I could probably, we could talk for hours and I think we want to have someone like you back on when your portfolio of 30 units is up to 60 and then you can share about, you know, what, maybe you bought an Island by then. Maybe we'll be visiting you in London. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll talk to you in, in two months. We're do, doing a huge refinance on all the buildings in Brooklyn. And then awesome. that's the capital we use for the next round of whatever we decide to do. Awesome. We think uh, some, some episodes, some people are comfortable with, you know, people contacting them and stuff. Are, I, I don't know if you are, we should have talked about it before the episode. If not. Oh yeah. I, yeah. Cause I, I mean, I intend to ramble and I know this is like a, so off the walls, like I was like, talking about something over here, over here, over here. Um, I'd be happy to, I'm not on social media. Uh, again, talk about getting your time back. If, if it's not part of your immediate job, get off of social media. It really helps. Uh, yeah, it is definitely I, a time and energy suck. It is part of ours now, but it's yeah, side, no, of course. It's yeah. a side hustle. We do it, but like you're right, it's it's a time yeah. suck. So if it, you're right, if it's not part of like what you're actually trying to build, then I agree. So do you um again, Rio Tomlin? Do you have a like? Do you, if I don't want to We he, maybe maybe people can connect with us. We'll connect them with you if they want to reach out yeah. directly via email. Or unless um, you want to give your email, it's up to you. Nah. Yeah, I'll give you. I'll give, no, I'll give you my work email. Um. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it's uh, Rio, R-I-O, Dulce, D-U-L-C-E, co, and then company, C-O, Rio Dulce Co at gmail.com. Gmail.com? Yep. Awesome. You heard it here first. Yes, sir. I think uh, Rio is a great person to connect with if you're in that 
you know, New York area, if you're in the Austin area, and maybe if, even if you're in the London area, we do have some, some Europe listeners. Or if you're intrigued in moving to Tokyo to become a car salesman. Yeah, which is, I think that's our next, we're going to do that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, Rio, this has been awesome. I, again, we could talk for hours. I think um, I have always been intrigued by your story, but this is actually the first time that you and I are sitting down and talking about it, and I think it's going to bring mm-hmm. us closer. I want to talk real estate anytime that you want to. We're, uh, you know, maybe there's an opportunity for us to even partner down the line. I, I, we will. I mean, I'm, I'm looking in the Philly market again, after that refinance Philly is on the list. So we have a lot to talk about. Awesome. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. That wraps us for episode 12 of the weekly juice podcast. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like subscribe, oh, yeah. follow, leave a review at weekly juice pod on Instagram and, uh, we would love a review on Apple yeah. iTunes. Yeah. Thanks, but thanks for joining us. Peace. Peace. Peace.